All right, thanks everyone for joining today. I know I said 1110, but we'll just let people trickle in and get started. Um, but thank you for coming. Um, you know, this is my first DrupalCon, so I'm a little nervous. Um, also, I'm a UX designer, so um, don't know that much about Drupal, but I'll try to teach you anyways. <laughs> Um, so my session today is Drupal for Designers speaking each other's language. Um, kind of a kind of a backstory. This is more of my origin story into Drupal. Um, I didn't know anything about Drupal, and I was working on Drupal projects. And so that kind of is what the um, the catalyst for me presenting this today is. You know, for anyone that's insecure, uh, maybe doesn't feel part of the conversation. You know, we want you to be heard, and we want to hear you, and then also have a conversation centered around that. So again, uh, my name is Maida. I'm a UX designer at Phase 2 Technology. Um, you probably saw our booth. It has a big tree. We got swings. We got all of that. Um, that's where we're located. Um, so um, accessibility advocate, just like our whole agency, we really you know, highly value that, um, as well as a noodle enthusiast. Um, and for anyone that's wondering, pho is my favorite noodle bowl. So again, we're phase two. Um, you'll see us in our light blue shirts um, located at booth 333. Uh, we are a full service digital product agency. Um, so we span across multiple industries. Um, you can hear more at our booth um, or even just hear more about our design system outline. Um, so we're going to do things a little differently today. Um, again, you know, this is really about striking a conversation. Um, so the expectation here is that we'll be talking to each other. Um, so I'll start off at the presentation with an overview, um, just kind of going through challenges that we face um, between different teams that we work with, whether it's designers, developers, content strategists. Um, talk about the discovery and design process from a phase two standpoint, how we've structured ourselves just to provide insight. Um, but then I'm open, going to open up the floor and present some questions to everyone here, um, just to kind of hear thoughts and experiences you've had working with cross-functional teams so that, you know, again, we can learn from each other. It's not just about me talking to you, but it's about talking to everyone. Everyone, that sound good? Everyone okay talking? Okay. <laughs> All right, um, so why are we here? Um, again, you know, we want to make sure that we're keeping all aspects of development as part of the conversation when we talk about Drupal development. Um, so here's a quote that I heard from an anonymous UX designer who said that I don't have much experience with Drupal, um, and not to be a snitch, but that UX designer was me. Um, that was me about three or four years ago. Um, I was working on solely Drupal projects, um, and I remember sitting in a client meeting, and a software architect was talking to me, and he was talking about panels, blocks, layout builder. I had no idea what he was talking about, yet I was making the designs. Um, that really struck a chord in me in terms of understanding what I'm doing. Uh, you know, a lot of times we tend to silo ourselves in the work we're doing, and we feel that it doesn't necessarily apply to us, especially as designers. We create you know, pretty solutions, intuitive solutions, but then we don't think about the back end that's making it work. But that being said, I'm not an expert, so don't hold me to it. <laughs> so designers and developers play a fundamental role through the process, um, but there's a lot of mystery surrounding the work we do. Um, we like to say that we really align ourselves to be cross-collaborative, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we do get siloed with the work we're doing, either whether it's deadlines, a bunch of meetings, we, so we want to make sure that we're talking to each other, but also understanding what we're doing at every phase of work. And then we just generally want a better understanding of a Drupal project from a designer standpoint. So just from a show of hands, um, who is a developer here? I thought so. Um, and who's a designer? OK, a lot more than I thought there'd be. Um, so I wanted to just kind of shed light on what process is from our standpoint on when we're working on a Drupal project. Um, you know, whether it's working with content strategy, wireframes, user research, and how that applies to a full team. And then again, we want to open a dialogue centered around designers within the Drupal community. Um, I was actually talking to someone earlier in this room. Um, at times, it can feel like there is, you know, the sense of gatekeeping that happens, um, whether it's intentional or unintentional, or maybe it's just something that I feel myself because I can be insecure about, you know, my expertise in Drupal, um, is, you know, opening the conversation so that we can talk to each other and understand where we can meet each other halfway. And so again, you know, why should designers know Drupal? Um, you know, for effective communication between teams. We don't want to, you know, 
be starting a project and not know what we're doing. Um, and the ability to create designs around Drupal frameworks. Um, I think this is probably the most important takeaway is understanding the design systems in place um, and the templates that are being used so that we can work around them as opposed to creating designs from scratch that may need to be hard coded at a later time. And then time and cost effectiveness. Again, making sure if we can work with the system, um, we will save time and money at the end of the day. And then why should developers know design? Um, so developers should know de the design process, um, not necessarily design itself, but just so that they can start you know, early planning and development, um, but also early input on concepts and ideation. Um, not every developer has to be a designer, not every designer has to be a developer by any means, but designers, you know, we, that's our job, but there's always great input that we can get from other people. Um, so making sure we include designers and developers early on in the project. And then just generally creating more synergy um, early on between design and development teams and the other teams that we work with. Um, again, we, we all wanna be friends. We all wanna make sure that we're aligned on any decision we make. So just making sure that we involve everyone early on in the process. So we want to work with the system and not against it. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has experienced this. I've experienced this numerous times where I've created wireframes, um, you know, taken them to a developer, software architect, and they're like, we can't do this. Um, and I'm always like, why can't you do it? You can do it. You're a coder. Just do it. And, you know, for them, you know, it's really about staying within scope of budget and timing. So just understanding level of effort early on in the process saves all, everyone heartache. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to dive into, you know, what our collaborative process looks like at phase two. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the designers here are familiar, um, but just wanted to give insight into specifically how we work and some of kind of the deliverables and artifacts that come out of it. So the people that we work with as designers, um, we work with clients. So we are heavily client-facing individuals. Um, so we're always answering to the clients, um, our internal teams. And I would say a third group up here are the users. Um, we are the user advocate, so making sure that we can also you know, include them in any conversation we have um, outside of business needs. And then understanding the line is always open. Um, so because we work with so many teams, we're constantly having to communicate, and that's probably the biggest um, asset that you need to have as a designer is being able to listen um, as you go through the process. And I think my calendar can also attest to that as well. <laughs> and the challenges we face when we don't talk to each other, um, again, lack of understanding between teams and clients, so playing a lot of Chinese telephone, just trying to you know, go from one person to the other. Um, you hear one thing, you hear another thing, and then at the end of the day, you deliver something that no one's aligned on. Um, and then also making sure that there's a single source of truth, whatever that means to you, whether it's you know, a change uh, management document, maybe it's a Miro board where everyone throws all their ideas together in one place. Um, I know during remote work, that's become something that I valued a lot, is setting up just kind of literally a brain dump folder or a brain dump template on Miro, Miro, where everyone just kind of throws all their thoughts in there and works off of one document for any sort of research work, planning, everything. And then again, missing out on optimizing time and cost. Um, when we don't talk to each other um, and we don't understand each other, we lose money. Um, and then feasibility, understanding what's possible early on as opposed to finding out later down the road when we go into actual development and planning. So the solution again is just involving all teams at the beginning of a project. Um, so I know we're talking about development and designers, um, but we want to also talk about the other groups in place. We have strategy, we have content strategists, we have data and insights teams. Um, you may have other teams on, you know, at your agencies, companies that you interact with. Um, these are just some examples of teams that I work with on a daily basis. So again, you know, when we when we don't work with each other and we don't work with each other's deliverables, we very much fall into a waterfall approach. Um, this is not a real sprint plan at all, so don't, don't look at the numbers on the top. Um, but we really want to take a look at, you know, kind of the waterfall approach we end up taking when we do design siloed and we don't necessarily start involving other teams early on in the process. However, something that we're doing at phase two is uh, actually getting that started early. Um, outline our web design system um, full of web components. We get started on that during the UX and design process. So any sort of designs that are built out are immediately sent to the developers to start building on their end. 
Um, and I think at vice versa, we utilize the design system as we create our wireframes. Um, so there's constantly some sort of so so single source of truth and template that we're working off of. Um, and that just allows to um, create more time and budget for any sort of complex items. So if there's any efficiencies what we can take away from, we use the design system. So I wanted to break down the design process um, from a phase two standpoint in terms of the different types of work we do. Um, again, you know, starting from discovery, we go into user research. User research is an ongoing process, although it's placed here as kind of that second bubble. Um, it's something that we're constantly doing and thinking about. Um, again, you know, budget and client needs can sometimes dictate how much user research we can do. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you know, especially designers, you want to do usability testing at every round of designs. You can't always do that. Um, so just understanding that we want to fit this in as many times as we can wherever possible with the budget and time we have. Um, and then actual design work. So actual design work, you know, includes wireframes, um, UI design, um, information architecture, just kind of really, you know, setting root for what we're going to build moving forward. Um, and then design handoff is also a big part of what we do. Um, so we do work with uh, our in-house development team. So it is a little easier in terms of doing handoff. I've worked with um, offshore developers um, where it's very different, where we have to actually write out functional specifications. Um, so that may look different for you, but just kind of give insight into how we do it here. Um, and then design QA. So a designer's job is never finished. Um, we're working through the full life cycle of the product, even after we've completed our designs. Um, we're still checking designs, so we're still playing a passive role towards the end. So discovery. Um, the purpose here is to define the problem to be solved. Um, so again, you know, this is the foundation of all the work we do. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, these are just examples of some of the kickoff activities we'll complete during this process. The one on top is, you know, the one on top is more client facing where we get them together and want to learn about just where they see themselves in a couple of years, what their vision, vision is for the product that we're creating, just to kind of get them excited about what we're talking about. Um, the one below is actually a more complex, um, so we'll start doing um, empathy mapping with them to identify what their users are looking for, um, as well as um, you know, value prop canvases that we use to understand you know, what, how they see this product benefiting their users. Um, and then we end up with strategic recommendations, that are usually in like a discovery findings deck that we'll create, um, and then project plan and roadmap that we um, create with our product managers. So key players here, we have our developers. Um, so again, you know, we bring in developers early on in the process. Um, the people you see here are, you know, you'll see them throughout the process, discovery process, as well as design process. Um, we have strategy and UX kind of taking the lead um, in terms of all the discovery um, deliverables that we're creating, conducting workshops, interviews with stakeholders, as well as users. Um, and then we also have content strategists that start early on. Um, the content strategist is, so one thing working with several different clients, you can't anticipate how big their content team is or how much content they have. Um, so it's best to get content strategists involved early on so you can start talking about the brand voice and tone right then and there. Um, and then we have data and insights. Um, so data and insights is really, you know, the team that's providing areas of improvement through analytics audits. So they're giving me pointers on terms of what different things I should hit on as I'm talking to our stakeholders and users. And then user research, this is my favorite part. Um, I love talking to people. Um, so this, you know, doing user interviews um, is probably the most important part of my job, I feel. Um, just understanding who the end users are and what their needs are. Um, you know, typically in any sort of project, it's usually our role to play that. It's also usually our responsibility to play that role. Um, so just making sure I can take that, kind of give the due diligence there. Um, so user research just helps us outline what our users' needs are, who our users are, in fact, um, and then how they perceive the product or service. Um, so a result of that is, you know, persona, segmentation, journey mapping, um, user interviews, service design blueprints, just depending on what kind of project you're working on. And then key players here, content strategists again. Um, we involve content strategists during the user research part as well, um, having them sit in, just hear what we have to say. Um, content strategy is really important at the agency in the sense that we want them to understand what um, users are looking for so that they can speak to those users. Um, one instance is you know, working on a children's hospital. 
um, children's hospital versus a, you know, a regular adult hospital, your content's going to look different. It's going to sound different. And you have to understand that early on. Um, so involving user interview, involving content strategists during that, com during that part of work really helps in terms of unearthing all that information for them. Um, data insights, they'll start tracking metrics and engagement to kind of give insight into what we need to focus on. Again, strategy and UX working together to conduct user interviews and any sort of other research we need at that time. And so design, um, so desi during design, um, we call, we involve UIA and site mapping into design. Um, that's one big um, phrase we use there. So it's kind of an overarching term. Um, we identify information architecture during this time based off of the user research so that that could include, you know, tree testing, um, any sort of card sorting we need to do, and then validate it there. Um, and then moving into wireframes from there. Um, and then during this time, we're also working on content again. Um, so one deliverable that really feeds into the work we're doing is MRA mapping, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and again, the result of this is an IA, um, built out wireframes, basic CMS setup on the back end with the developers, um, feasibility matrix. Um, so this is where we start talking about what's possible. We start bringing up, you know, features, we start bringing up design build to understand, you know, how we can we move forward um, in the most efficient way. So key players, again, developers. Um, so developers are the ones that are really identifying that matrix for us, uh, feasibility matrix. Content strategists. Um, so content strategists actually start writing content at this point, um, key content, I would say, the headlines, um, just so that the client can start visualizing their pages in a way that's more meaningful to them. Um, and translating wireframes into design mockups, um, and then validating. So strategy will validate designs based off of their proposed strategy. So strategists stay on board, um, maybe more in a passive role, but they're still providing input. Um, and then again, UX creating wireframes um, and IA. So this is an example of an MRA map. It's not the full MRA map. Um, I couldn't include that in here because of client reasons. Um, but what we start off with is an analytics audit um, and site crawls that really dictate what different websites we should be looking at, especially if it's a big enterprise website. Um, again, right now I'm working on a healthcare system. They have about, an av about I think, 33 websites, Marshall, in there, 33? Um, 33 websites that they're utilizing. Um, so we had our data and insights team go in there and try to take out any redundant links, any sort of broken pages, and try to consolidate so that we can identify what websites we should be looking at for our content MRA map. Um, the content MRA map is basically a spreadsheet we create um, that identifies content that needs to be migrated, rewritten, or archived. Um, and this really helps define the IA. When we know what kind of content's available to us, we can start visualizing pages in a more meaningful way. So to remove any sort of redundancies and identify moments of consolidation. And then, again, that defines the IA that we move forward with um, based off of the content that's created in the MRA map. Um, MRA maps can be very long um, and tedious work. However, I do believe they're very much worth it at the end, especially for a content strategist, kind of lays a foundation for what they're doing. And then here is an example of a feasibility matrix um, that we've created in the past, identifying features we need to build um, for a platform we were creating. Um, so think of this as basically um, point estimation that you would be doing in any sort of Scrum project that you most likely is happening in JIRA, um, except this is happening on a Miro board and you have multiple teams present for this. Um, so you'll have your content strategist, you'll have UX, you'll have your developers or software architect, and you also have project managers and product managers. Um, the idea here is to understand not only feasibility from a level of effort standpoint and budgetary standpoint, but also for people like us designers who, you know, want under, you know, really want have user input that we want to bring to the table. Um, so it allows us to create a feasibility matrix based off of all those different players we have and all the different clients we're working with. And then you'll see just the, the color dots are really just to identify um, big, small, or large. It's very broad how we do this, but it's really just to start the laying the foundation of any sort of sprint planning we have to do moving forward. And it also includes design. So it may not just be developments, also design components, content, everything included in there. And then we have design handoff. Um, so this can be different amongst teams. I know everyone does this differently based off of where you are, what agency, company you're working for. Um, however, because we have a great in-house team, we don't have to do too much explaining, um, again, because we talk to each other all day. 
Um, so we create prototypes and sometimes functional specifications, so just annotations on Figma files when we deliver. Um, so it's never anything too thorough um, because again, we're working closely throughout the full scale of the process. Um, designers and developers are working from the very beginning. Um, so again, developers are validating designs for us for feasibility and function. Content strategists deliver content, framework, and new content. So we're placing in actual content into our designs um, at every moment that we deliver designs so that, again, clients can start visualizing. Um, and we get a lot of comments about that. You know, it, how about if we add an extra paragraph, how would this page look? So in order to just kind of mitigate a lot of those questions, we start early on. Um, and then UX, UX did QA's design work, ensuring it aligns with wireframes, and then UI is creating the prototypes based on the existing wireframes. And then design QA, so, you know, again, our job is never done. Um, we're still doing, um, looking at designs after the handoff. Um, it's our responsibility as the creators of the pages and the design on website to make sure that it functions the way we intended. Um, so we have quality assurance, identifying errors and bugs, developers remediating that. Uh, we have UX ensuring website functions as needed, and then UI making sure that it looks as intended. And then one other thing I wanted to hit on is, you know, clients are also part of the conversation. Um, you know, we, we talk about, we're talking about, you know, having a conversation with, with each other um, as an internal team, but we also want to include clients as a stakeholder and as, you know, a product owner. So this actually came from an experience I had myself in the past is, you know, trying to talk to clients about highly technical things um, they don't understand. And when they don't understand, they often just stop listening. And then when they stop listening, they don't think you're doing the right thing. Um, so making sure we can talk to them in a way that makes sense to them. Um, so these are just a couple of phrases um, that, you know, to keep in mind as you're talking to a client about the work you're doing, um, nodes, pieces of content, views, page displays. And honestly, this was really helpful for me, too, because I would talk to developers, and I had no idea what they were talking about half the time. So um, I think this is helpful for everyone to just kind of have a basic understanding of terminology. Um, and then not overwhelming the client. Um, so understanding, you know, making sure that we provide um, logical groups and chunks when we pr present to clients as opposed to a full build or full design. And then showing bits of functionality. So maybe starting with a mega menu and then, you know, a footer as opposed to showing a full scale website. And then um, identifying and using real content for content types. Um, again, this has probably been the biggest takeaway for me working with content strategy is using real content um, and getting them involved early on the process so they can start building that content for my wireframes. Um, so I don't even wait for you know mockups. I start placing in content in our wireframes. And if we don't have full content, we create frameworks around it so we can place in content, have at least sort of placeholder text for that. All right, so, you know, this is cool and all, but why is this important? Um, hopefully you understood why it's important by now, but if not, um, I have some summary slides. Um, so client and um, editors are also end users of the products we create. So, um, and I mean this in the sense that we should understand how to talk to them, but we should also understand how to create a backend experience that makes sense to them. Um, so understanding the CMS, um, you know, understanding how we need to create workflows for them, uh, understanding, you know, if there's any sort of help text we need to create for them where we need to place it. So we're not just working on the front end experiences, we're also working on the back end experiences, which is something, honestly, you know, I haven't seen as much. It's something that I'm also working on is making sure I'm making conscious effort to think about the back end experience for them from an editor experience. And then, again, in order to work efficiently, we have to collaborate early on. Um, we have to make sure we're talking to each other. We have to make sure that we understand the nuances of the work we're doing early on so that we can help each other out. Um, a lot of times, you know, deliverables can be seen as more just client-facing artifacts that we send over. Um, but they should be tools that we use to help each other. Um, those deliverables we send to clients should also be deliverables that we're utilizing internally to maybe, you know, help the work that we're doing. And again, designers should be thinking about the end product and the back end experience that makes it work. Um, it just makes us better designers at the end of the day. Um, it makes us, you know, it helps us understand the people around us. Um, it makes us have better conversations. Um, and then it just, you know, gives us an understanding of how to be more efficient in the work that we're doing. 
All right, so I did my piece. I talked um, for a couple of minutes, um, but I did want to hear from the floor. I know we have a good um, you know, ratio of designers and developers here, and I know many of you probably come from different industries, agencies. Um, so I wanted to hear some of you know, the issues that everyone in the room has had in the past working with groups. Go ahead. So we've used Airtable in the past, um, but kind of to your point, I think the biggest issue isn't necessarily finding the right tool, it's finding a tool that clients find accessible. Um, we've done comments and Figma files in the past, but you know they sometimes just don't know how to access the Figma files. There's always kind of that learning curve that's associated with it. Um, so something that I've consciously been trying to do is actually provide trainings on how to comment. Um, so when we deliver any sort of, um, you know, wireframe or IA, actually recently delivered an IA, I actually had to include slides on how to provide feedback. Um, and we kind of just reuse, reuse those slides amongst each other within the UX team. So we created a couple um, and we've created documents specifically for those comments. So again, to your point, you know, I don't think there's the best tool that I found, but I think there's practices around making it easier for people, um, you know, just providing for the sitemap, we had to literally lay out for them, you know, that you're commenting on the relationship of different pages. Um, you need to comment on if the naming structure makes sense to you. Like even small things like that, I think really go a long way for them. And if anyone else has any suggestions too, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. So it's more of like a feedback survey that you provide them and, oh, okay. And then you collect that on the back end and you do it for every single deliverable you're sending out or page or... Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, can you repeat that last part? Sorry. Yeah, and so I've come across that issue in the past where we've had multiple changes or there was a work order in the middle of a project and they're like, actually want to pivot and do something else. Can you add these things? Um, so we just go back to that feasibility matrix again. Um, we kind of get our heads back and start creating features again and placing them on a matrix. And there have been times where we've actually gotten clients involved in that so that they understand um, how much of a budgetary concern it could be or a timing concern it can be so that there's full transparency there for them. Um, but from for the first part of your question about bringing value to design, um, I think the most important part for me is really valuing the data and insights team I work with. Um, you can't you can't argue with numbers um, as much as you know clients want to, but when you kind of put it to them or put it you know in front of their faces, that's something that they can't deny. Um, and also just being able to do A B testing, um, that's something I. I would like to be a bigger advocate for as well as, you know, putting more money towards A-B testing so that we can validate that way. It just happens to be that some projects, you don't have much budget to actually validate in, in certain ways. So I really le heavily lean on the data and insights team when we do that. So making sure that we include them in any sort of presentation work we do, um, 
bring in facts and figures from them. Um, so basically the deliverables we have are very much collaborative with the data and insights team when, whenever, whenever we deliver. It's not just solely UX. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so I, this is probably not the perfect answer because I think I'm actually struggling with that race right now. Um, I have a client um, and the client is the technically the product owner, but he also has um, about 12 people working above him that he has to answer to and he isn't the most assertive person in the world, I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, and um, so working with him has been interesting. So I feel like, I think that question that you asked is something that I'm actually struggling with myself. Um, you know, one thing that we've had to do is actually more design work um, to get the point across, um, making sure that they're involved and actually doing more presentations that we need to. So creating micro presentations for their leadership, um, something that we've been doing is so that if he isn't necessarily the best of translators, at least we can be. Um, and I am very wary of ever sending designs to a product owner that has 10 people that he's answering to and just handing it over to him or her or they, whoever it is. Um, so for me, it's, you know, I wanna be part of that conversation at all times when I'm managing a, a group of clients is making sure that my voice is part of that conversation or, or my team's voice is part of that conversation during every point of the engagement. But yeah, to your point, there have been many times where we've had a client that we thought was just one product owner and ended up being, you know, 30 people. Um, so it is, it's hard to manage. So you have to have really good account directors too. <laughs> Yeah. And the blue shirt in the back. Yeah, and it's also in-house teams that they have. Um, you know, we, we have a client right now that has their own design team, um, yet we're doing design for them. Um, so there's also a sense of management that we're experiencing there as, you know, how can we leverage as a design team that currently exists for our benefit, but also without overstepping and then them overstepping us. Um, so they are also a sense a client that we're working with as well within that same group of clients. Um, so it's been a lot of dodging um, calls, but also making sure that we're planning extra calls um, we also include ourselves in their weekly syncs, design sprint syncs, um, so that we at least know what's going on on their end or we can hear something, we can flag it early. Yeah, so the data and insights team we have, um, a lot of it centered around Google Analytics. Um, uh, we have, you know, Hotjar that we utilize, like qualitative measures. Um, and we utilize them throughout the process of the work we're doing. So they create data measurement models um, for the client or whoever we're working with to understand how they should be properly targeting, um, creating metrics for them. Um, but they also help me in terms of understanding, um, you know, what pages I should be focusing on, whether it's drop off, maybe it's, you know, a high bounce rate. Um, so basic analytics work is what, how we utilize them from a UX perspective, um, making sure to validate any sort of design work we're doing. So, or maybe if client's pushing back on, you know, some maybe we want to create a blog for them and they're like, well, we don't want a blog. And yet we see, you know, majority of their users going through articles on their website. Um, in order to make that argument, we, we utilize our data and insights team. So the UX designers on our team, including myself, um, I am well versed in analytics, but however, they kind of take a deeper dive. They do it on a daily basis. I don't have to do that work. Um, I can just go to them and they'll provide me some numbers, plug it in, and then present it to a client. No, and do you mean um, front end design on the back end, like the CMS? 
Yeah, so I don't have much experience, but that's something I've actually been working on recently is understanding how I can um, how I can test that and conduct user research on the back end for clients. Um, so I don't have much experience, but I'd be open to hearing more if you have any suggestions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't want everyone to hear? <laughs> Yeah, so for this specific project, again, um, the biggest takeaway there was I actually put content in front of users um, during my usability testing, my first round of usability testing, um, and I actually recorded it and showed it to the clients. Um, they were saying, you know, this doesn't make sense, a lot of the information is redundant. Um, so I think that kind of nailed the point across for them in terms of how they see themselves moving forward. But from more of like a revising and editing standpoint, um, I think it's I think the easiest way to prioritize is what aligns with your users at the end of the day. You know, what information is kind of your MVP and then everything else you can build around that. Um, issues that we've come across are, you know, clients may not have a content team. So we're making all these suggestions and recommendations and they're like, oh, this is great, but we need to hire people now. Um, so that's an issue that we've come across in the past is, you know, we make all these suggestions and yet they don't have resourcing for it. Um, so something that we have to offer is, you know, maybe providing a content framework for them so that they can work on it slowly. Um, creating placeholder text that would be similar to what they would be using on their final site, even if they can't agree on it. At least there's, you know, certain topics that we can talk about within that, um, even if it's like certain headlines. Um, so focusing on as much as we can at that time, may not, maybe it's not all the body copy, but we're talking about headlines. Um, and again, aligning it with users that what users have said. I work in, I work extensively in healthcare. Um, so for me, you know, it's really centered around making sure that if someone's coming onto a website and they're looking for, for financial assistance information, that's the content we're going to focus on right then and there. I mean, that's the case for most patients when they come on a website. Um, they're looking for financial assistance and bill pay. Um, so just aligning it with the motivations of the user is kind of how we move forward in terms of prioritizing. Content frameworks. Yeah, so I'm not too sure about what our content strategists use. Um, we do kind of create content, content outlines. Oh, Felicia, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think to that point, the framework is also delivered multiple times. Um, so the first framework is more just a governance tool about like this is how you should be writing your information. This is what the expectations are. This is these are the resources you need in order to complete it. Um, and then we go into more of like the MRA mapping and the governance, um, kind of that spreadsheet, the snippet of it, I couldn't show you the whole thing. Um, but just in terms of, you know, identifying level of effort needed for each piece of content, each page, each website on each, each page on each website, um, and that's delivered to them with the URL as well associated with it. Um, so it's, it's quite a dense document, um, if you were to take a look at it, yeah. Um, and it takes a long time, um, but I think it really helps them in terms of going back in there and identifying, and especially just putting the URLs in there, I think is the most helpful thing. They just click on it and they're like, oh, this is where it is. Because a lot of times product owners don't even know their own product that thoroughly. Thank you. 
kids and now that's like an actual mm -hmm. active want and so they just have constant requests um for that or, or I'm just wondering isn't that through the day in most churches is there a point in the process where it's you can make it loud um and so the process is just less noise coming in? Yeah, hundred percent. Um that's something we've actually been talking about internally is you know productizing that. You know, that's something that's a selling point. It's not necessarily about the front-end experience you're providing, but it's also the back-end editing experience and how easy it is to use. Um, one thing I've heard from clients are, you know, we couldn't use this, um, so we went to another vendor. You literally change vendors because you couldn't use the CMS, and that's a pretty easily <laughs> solvable solution that you could have made. Um, yeah, so we've definitely been thinking about that, and I think that's a great suggestion is including it in the feasibility matrix and start thinking about that early on because typically we don't focus on that until later when we're delivering the website, and then we have to do trainings associated to it. Um, so something we've been thinking about is productizing it, but also understanding what kind of help text they may need. Um, we're meeting them halfway in terms of their tech literacy. Some, some clients tend to be very tech literate. Some aren't. Um, so understanding that early on so we can provide that experience. So I've definitely been consciously trying to make that a part of my process as of lately, um, just understanding how clients come back to us with so many questions, and we could just alleviate that early on. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean for language it's a little hard. Actually, I mean I don't know if anyone's here from that company. There is a company represented here at DrupalCon Lingotech that's um, working on creating an add-on on Drupal that accommodates to that. Um, so that's an issue I've also experienced is multilingual design. Um, it can vary depending on just kind of the type of characters that are being used. Um, also, if you're reading from right to left versus left to right is also a big thing. Um, so I think really for that is just Honestly, the way I perceive it, if anyone has any suggestions, I'm more than happy to say whatever you want. But I just try to leave as much space as possible. Um, I don't make the assumption that the content here is a true content, right? So making sure that you can design for probably the widest amount of content and then work your way back. So it's the opposite of doing mobile first design. You're actually doing like a wide desktop version and then trying to figure out how it fits from there. Um, so that's kind of my approach. But you know, if anyone else has any suggestions. Yeah, um, that's definitely part of the process. I think we have to sit down with them and understand who we're working with. Um, and I think it's also about not using that terminology. Um, you know, <laughs> you have to really just kind of use layman's terms when you're talking. Um, because again, if you're trying to teach them constantly, you're not doing your job, right? Um, so I think it's really about just making sure that we're using the terminology that they're familiar with. Um, I was on a call kind of recently and I was talking about an MVP which I, everyone here probably is like, oh, MVP. Um, they didn't know what an MVP was, and I kept saying it. And then I think throughout, like, probably towards the end of the call, they were like, I'm sorry, can you um, explain what an MVP is? And so in that moment, I was like, this whole, this whole conversation we had was just null and void. It went nowhere. Um, so I think it's really just, you know, making sure that we meet them halfway where they are. Um, but again, to the point earlier, even about the information architecture I delivered, include slides. You know, talk to them. Um, these are these are the things that you should know. Um, this is maybe if maybe if you can't necessarily fully do everything in layman's terms, provide them. You know, some sort of glossary. I actually included a glossary at the end of this deck um, of just basic Drupal terminology um, that I've had to pick up in the past. Um, I don't know if I can share this deck or not, but it, yeah, if you want to take pictures. <laughs> um, but just you know, as a way to kind of level set with them is just really 
something I've had to experience, just a lot of teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the kind of the easiest way to do that is making your files accessible at all times. Um, just making an active, you know, conscious decision to share things early on is really kind of, I mean, all of our Figma files are kind of that are open source. We open them to everyone. So the expectations, if you're on a project team, you should be looking at them. Um, and providing active feedback. Um, so I think the ex setting expectations early on where we're not just siloed. This is, you know, this is the phase of work you're responsible for. This is the phase of work you're responsible for. It's constant, everyone's active on the project at all times. And then also the feasibility matrix, making sure everyone's included in that. So there's never, you know, that doesn't happen just with a couple of people. It's everyone that's involved in the team and making sure you resource that team early on. Um, so you know who's involved on that team. You don't bring on, you know, a site builder or, you know, back-end developer later in the project. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm not that, still not that comfortable, honestly. I'm standing up here because I was told I wanted, I was to do it. Because <laughs> I can talk. Um, but I'm still not that comfortable, and I think that's fine, right? Um, I think the reason why a lot of people don't even engage with it is because they're just like, well, I don't even know where to start. Um, so for me, it, honestly, I, at my previous agency, I had a software architect that actually sat down with me. Um, he literally helped, like this glossary you see here was a result of the work he did with me. And it was me being genuinely curious about it. Um, again, one thing I've noticed on design teams is that we're just not actively curious about these things because we're never told to learn it. Um, so I think that's really kind of the gist of it is just making sure. There's actually a couple of books from O'Reilly as well that are pretty good. They're a little outdated, I would say, but I think that's a great starting point. It's called Drupal for Designers too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just get back end CMS access and you'll see kind of like what fields look like, things like that, and it'll kind of bring more insight into what everyone's talking about every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's completely valid. I mean, I used to hear the word WYSIWYG on all, all the time, and I was like, what the hell is a WYSIWYG? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, it makes no sense to me. And I remember, you know, creating wireframes where I would have, like, all these elaborate, like, spots for media types, and then they just weren't supported on the back end. So I think that's how I learned was when I got a lot of no's. Like, you can't do this. And that's when I was like, well, let me figure it out. <laughs> Right, and I know we're ending near at the end of our time. If there are any other questions, um, feel free to come up. Um, I'll be at the booth, um, our tree booth, so you can find me there if you have any other questions or just comments. But thank you for joining, everyone. <laughs>